nation. Please pray with me. Startle us, O oh God. Startle us anew with your truth. And by the power of your living spirit, open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, and our minds to these words, your holy word, that we might draw closer to Christ, empowered to go forth as his faithful disciples in the world. Amen. The countdown is on. One year from now, we will be heading to the polls to vote in the 2020 presidential elections. And for many of us, the thought of what happens between now and then is a little bit anxiety producing. Uh, we can easily imagine the contentious conversations ahead, the heated online arguments and the partisan political views that get increasingly more polarizing by the hour. And it is easy to imagine because we just got a good dose of it this week with the impeachment hearings. Headlines and coverage of the hearings varied so dramatically, it sometimes felt like the media was describing different events. And during my channel surfing, I witnessed some blaming and some shaming and even some name calling. Unkind words were a dime a dozen, and this doesn't even take into account all the insults, slurs, and slanders spewed all over social media at the same time. And unfortunately, what I did not witness much of was civility. But here's the thing. Whether you believe our country's problems are party-specific, socioeconomic, geographic, and or generational, the most important thing to realize about the conflict at hand is that it is a direct result of choices we are making. Friends, we are choosing to be in conflict with each other. We are choosing to surround ourselves with like-minded people, our teams and tribes. We are choosing to limit our intake of information to only like-minded news sources, our echo chambers. We are choosing to finger point and place all the blame on the opposite political party. And we are choosing to label ourselves us and our opponents them othering anyone whose point of view or belief system differs even slightly from our own. We are choosing to be divisive. But these are not the choices that Christ is calling us to make. They are not. Christ calls us to unity, which means being peacemakers in ways that will put an end to this divisiveness, which also means extending radical hospitality, genuine love, human dignity, and respect to all, even when it is downright difficult. So to encourage making better choices, we have dedicated the entire month of November to focusing on ways that Christians can be peacemakers in a culture that seems hopelessly divided and at war with itself. This Under God sermon series is an effort to encourage all of us to begin making different choices about how we see and listen and talk to those with whom we disagree for the future of our country, our families, our children and grandchildren, and dare I say, our sanity. We hope and pray that the time of transformation is now and that the place it begins is right here in Austin, Texas with us, Shepherd of the Hills. So to help us begin making better choices and take steps towards transformation, we've been given some homework assignments. Um, the first was to read, engage, and listen voices outside our uh, usual repertoire, voices with a different point of view. Then our second one was uh, challenging ourselves to look at why, ask the why question, to dig deeper to the underlying um, values um, that make us have these emotional reactions, especially when they're negative and then to figure out why we feel threatened by differing views. Because knowing our whys helps us understand ourselves better, articulate our point of view better, and hopefully have empathy for others and their points of view too. And then third, we were challenged to use the phrase, tell me more, as often as possible, when we encounter someone who sees things a little differently than we do. Instead of coming back at them, ask them, tell me more. All of these are ways that Christ can call us to be peacemakers, and he is beckoning us to do so. And now today's edition is, we become peacemakers when we learn to speak with loving words and act in loving ways. 
And that sounds easy, speaking loving words. While we're sitting here all comfortable in the sanctuary this morning, but chances are it becomes a bit more challenging the moment we step outside the doors and find ourselves in the middle of a contentious political argument. Sarah Stewart Holland and Beth Silvers, they're the hosts of the podcast Pantsuit Politics, and they also authored a book together called I Think You're Wrong, But I'm Listening. Um, It's on our reading list. I highly suggest it to you all. And they have some good advice for us in times like this. In chapter five of their book, entitled Give Grace, they encourage us that once we've done the work on our whys and our underlying values, to start engaging others in thoughtful dialogue. And that the very first step in doing that is giving grace. They believe that our current political dialogue is diseased with the sickness caused by a grace deficiency. So here's their counsel for countering this grace deficiency. They say, and I'm going to put it on the screen so you can see it too. When we talk on the podcast about the need for grace in our political discussions, we mean infusing discussions with kindness and respect for no other reason than to uphold the dignity of our fellow humans. We mean extending the same unmerited love that we believe flows from God to even our most strident political adversaries. We mean celebrating our fellow Americans rather than dismissing each other based on party labels, policy positions, and voting records. And we mean recognizing the unproven, unverifiable worthiness in every person we encounter. We mean seeing each person as enough, whether or not we agree with them. So they challenge us then to imagine the transformation, the transformative impact that could happen if we were all doing this, if we all saw ourselves as in this together, in this big, messy country of ours, working through the diversity of perspectives that is inherent of our American fabric. Now, granted, most of us can see the benefit of giving grace through loving words and acts, especially when they lead to understanding or relationship building. But over the last couple weeks, as we've heard the other sermons, I've had a few conversations with people, and it seems that what we're having a hard time grappling with is even wanting to build these relationships and gain an understanding of others, especially if we believe because the chasm between us and them is too wide, or, or the word I heard is if we feel evil is involved. That seems to be where we're at. So unfortunately, these feelings are not new, and they're not particular to us, and they're not new to us or um, in this particular time in history. It's an issue that people have been forced to face repeatedly throughout the centuries, including the early days of Christianity in the first century AD. And if you remember at that time, the Roman Empire was the dominant political and military force in the world, and the city of Rome sat at its center with about a million citizens, all from different, many different cultures living there. And Christian and Jews were among those living in this pluralistic society. In addition to being pluralistic, it was also polytheistic, so that a to- they were tolerant of a multitude of religious beliefs and expressions, but your observance and worship um, of many different gods was okay for the empire as long as it included worshiping the emperor too. And so that caused a problem, right, for our monotheistic Christians and Jews. This is a big issue because claiming only one God alone made it where they had to refuse worshiping the emperor and acknowledge him as any kind of deity. And because of that, persecution ensued. And in 49 AD, the Roman emperor Claudius, he expelled all the Jews from Rome. And five years later, when he died, his heir and successor was the Emperor Nero, who took control and then followed in those same steps of persecution, only this time choosing to persecute Christians, whom he would have captured and burned just to light his garden at night. So there are some problems here, right? There are a couple of different things to pay attention to. Um, First, while the Jews were expelled in those five years, part of those were Jewish Christians. So when they got to come home after Claudius died, Um, they arrived back into a Rome that um, had changed. The Christian tone had changed because the Gentile Christians had made some new decisions and grown and done things. So all of a sudden now they are in disagreements over circumcision and idol worship and dietary restrictions and religious rituals. And they're not seeing eye to eye. And so in-group conflict ensues. 
And now they're also having conflict with those in society as well, because those who have converted to Christianity are having problems with their friends, family, neighbors, coworkers, because they are now believing in something that their um, counterparts did not. They didn't like these new things that the Christians were professing or the behaviors that they were practicing. So tension started growing in these circles too. And that's where the Apostle Paul steps in and he's gonna write this letter to the church in Rome and he's calling for that same kind of transformation that Sarah and Beth talked about in that quote. That we need to see um, ourselves as being in this together. And so I invite you now to listen for God's word to you as spoken through Paul's pen in the letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verses 9 through 18. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. And if it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. This is the word of the Lord. Paul's words are as timely as ever, huh? He gives over 20 ways in which they and us now are called to action to love and live in harmony with one another. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Bless those who persecute you. Do not curse them. Resist repaying evil for evil and live peaceably with all. It is clear from his teachings that we cannot be maligning each other with mean and hateful words. Degrading others in such a way obscures our ability to see the image of God in them, which separates us further as well as separating us from God in the process too. This is not loving with mutual affection. This is not living in harmony with one another. But however, I wanna be clear. Paul is also not commanding passive submission to the evils of the world, but rather commending a still more excellent way. In light of this, how do we respond to hatred, hatefulness, hate speech, hateful actions, and hate-filled thoughts and ideas. What examples can we set as peacemakers? What higher, most excellent way can we witness? Well, there are three stories I'd like to share this morning that um, I think we should take into consideration about our ability to respond to hate in loving, creative, and even humorous ways if we'll invest ourselves in making the effort to discover these ways. So the first one took place in Knoxville, Tennessee in 2007 when a white supremacist group um, uh, rented a public park in Knoxville, Tennessee to hold one of their rallies. And as is usually the case for the rallies, uh, you know, yelling meets yelling, anger meets yanger, anger, and um, chaos ensues. But one year, um, some local activists decided they wanted to change um, and meet the supremacists with humor instead. So they formed the CCC, the coup, C-O-U-P, Klutz Clowns. And they prepared well for the day. They had all these props and um, costumes. They wore little party hats. And they lined the streets. And when the white supremacists came in yelling white power, they misunderstood and white flour and they started spewing bags of white flour everywhere. White dust is all over the air. 
The supremacists, no, white power, to which they then had bouquets of flowers, and they start throwing all these white flowers in the air, green stems and petals flying. And it just ensued. For every time they would continue yelling, the clowns met them with different misunderstanding antics. And finally, they got a little disheartened, and they left an hour and a half early. They did not keep their full time at the park. And singer-songwriter David Lamont shares this story in a children's book entitled White Flower, and at the end, in a little epilogue, he said, he understands our fight or flight programming, but he wants to challenge us all to think of a third way to respond to aggression, which is with creativity. And he said this, if we can be creative enough to find ways to disarm hatred without either retreating or yielding to hatred ourselves, we often find that more constructive outcomes become possible. And then he goes on to say that he does not recommend that these clown actions are always the way to respond to such events. It worked that day. Um, but he does challenge us to think creatively and especially to, be, to refuse to become that which we abhor. And then he reminds us of Dr. Martin Luther King's um, challenge to us that darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that, and hate cannot out drive out hate, only love can do that. So, whereas the story of White Flower exhibits kind of meeting hate with humor, the second one demonstrates, I think, how you can actually counter hateful actions with loving actions. Um, this happened in 2014. There's a small village in Germany. I think I might say this wrong, but Wunseidel. And it was uh, once the burial site of um, Rudolf Hess, Adolf Hitler's deputy. And so it became the chosen location for some neo-Nazis who would gather every year there for a march. Kind of similar to what we just saw in Knoxville, um, the locals wanted to stand up to this display of hate. Um, and so they came up with a clever response too. And on November 15, 2014, instead of not showing up for the march like they had done for all the years before, they came out in droves. They lined the streets welcoming and cheering the neo-Nazis on because for every step those neo-Nazis were taking, um, they had pledged 10 years euros per step to um, organizations that were trying to get rid of extremism in the country. So in effect, it, they turned it into an involuntary walkathon. So for every step that the, they took, they had, you know, they were raising money for their demise initially. So they had to decide if they were going to keep marching or um, let that, those funds build up. Well, they decided to keep marching and the people lined the streets. They had um, charged walked the, the streets thanking them for raising so much money to fight hate. Um, they set up uh, tables offering water to the marchers, um, which is it? It's actually out of the passage we read today. I cut a little short at verse 18, but if you go on to verse 20, Paul says, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. So they had those water set up and uh, met it with a, a creative way. Now, the final example I'd like to share um, isn't, doesn't require as much risk as going face-to-face -face with uh, supremacy or uh, anything, but it does require personal vulnerability. And to me, it illustrates the transformation that can happen if we take the time and we make the effort to truly listen and to truly understand the whys that are underlying another person's positions so that a healthy relationship can be born. And now this is the story of two colleagues, two colleagues who typically had opinions on opposite ends of the spectrum regarding many different issues. Um, nevertheless, they managed to build a relationship. Actually, they, they built a good friendship um, that allowed them to learn and grow and be better because of each other. So here's a minute clip of two friends. Supreme Court Justices Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Antonin Scalia may butt heads on the bench. You know, what's not to like? <laughs> Except her views of the law, of course. <laughs> but surprisingly shared the closest friendship of all the justices. Why don't you call us the odd couple? <laughs> and their political differences are an elephant in the room they aren't afraid to confront or ride, as they did on vacation together in India in 1994. 
Was that fun. was a rather bumpy ride. <laughs> <laughs> Scalia clearly admires his pint-sized partner's taste for adventure on their trips. And Ruth, honest to goodness, went up behind a motorboat in a one of those sail. Parasail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, she's so light you would think she would never come down. <laughs> Scalia even helped his friend out by giving her an advanced copy of his dissenting opinion so she could better write what is now a landmark majority opinion. Striking down an all-male admission policy at a public college. So I took this dissent, this very spicy dissent, and, and it absolutely ruined my weekend at the Second <laughs> Circuit. <laughs> The tone, the body language, the glint in their eyes, you can tell that they care and understand each other. So I'd like to close by pointing out that if, if we choose to continue dividing and separating and hunkering down in teams and tribes who simply yell our positions and points of view across the chasm at each other, nothing will ever change. Because who is listening? Nobody. Who's learning? Nobody. Who is being transformed? Nobody. The model is not working. And we are all suffering because of it. So let's commit ourselves to a new way of doing things. Let's make the choice to reach out and actively build relationships with someone on the other side of the chasm. So this is our next homework assignment, to talk with someone whom you know you have disagreements and differing opinions with, and if at all possible, more than one time, more than two, more than three, covenant with them to have open and honest conversations to learn the underlying values beneath their why. Scalia and RBG did it, Sarah from the left and Beth from the right did it, and I believe we can do it too. Building bridges in these relationships is what makes transformation possible, so let's begin today by taking seriously the fact that we become peacemakers when we learn to speak with loving words and act in loving ways. May it be so. Amen. I'd like to close today with the peace prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. Will you please pray with me? Lord, Make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive and it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it's in dying that we are born to eternal life. We pray all this through the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy